Our values form a key part of who we are. What we believe underneath the surface, sometimes we won't be saying it out loud, these things that we hold to be so true, but they really form the foundation of who we are. The things that we believe and the things that we value might connect with our family groups, our culture, the people we hang out with, maybe our whole country. But these values really determine the why we do things and how we go about things. We especially see values coming to the fore when trouble comes, when crises hit. We've seen just in the last few weeks in America how the value system of a culture can cause great conflict and great concern. We've seen how some people react when trouble comes. Some people react in violence, others react in peace. And of course, we only really see in the media the very best and the very worst. But throughout this, we've had a, a picture standing back and looking in. We can see that this terrible uh, infliction upon the culture, these this values come out because some people greatly value diversity of culture and ethnicity and skin color. Some people embrace that and, and, and in some ways are blinded to it. Other people see those things as being scary and are fearful of differences. Some even think that their difference is what makes them dominant, is what means they should be allowed to be the ones in control. Now, whatever your beliefs where you stand, we've definitely seen how some values have led people to, to hold on to security, being the very most important thing to see, that the streets will be locked down, that everyone go back to their homes, security is key. Whereas other people see the value of protest, of being able to voice their opinions, being of highest value. In the midst of this, we see, of course, some people's values leading them to utter chaos and vandalism and, and theft. Whereas other people will see this as an opportunity just to embrace change and to go for the, the humble, the kneeling, the loving way to bring about change. Uh, whichever way people kind of stand, it shows what's going on in the depths of their being, what's going on in their hearts. Crises often bring out our values. We've seen that in our country throughout the last few months where we've had restrictions on our lives. Some people have dealt differently with uh, the coronavirus and these restrictions because of their underlying beliefs, because of their values. Actually, one of the things that I've heard time and time again is people saying how much they've loved the simpler life. The opportunity to have more time at home, whether that's because they have more time with their family or perhaps they love the solitude and the peace and the quiet that this time is bought. Other people will just be loving the value of schooling now that the schools are back open again and they're now getting some peace and quiet because of that. Wherever you are, we, we see these times and we see these benefits and we want to hold on to the good and let go of the bad. We want to perhaps cling to some of those family values or the simpler life. Yet when life returns back to normal, when we go back to the busyness and the things that we were doing, how do we hold on to those differences that we most want, that we most appreciated, that we want to cling to? How do we do that? We do that by having firm and concrete boundaries, by saying, this is what we want and no more. Our values, as we think them through and set them in place, start to build for us the foundation of our lives. And if you haven't set values, then it's possible to be moved and swayed to different views and opinions, beliefs, and oftentimes, like peer pressure, will be pressured towards to go towards the values of another, which oftentimes isn't the best value for our lives. Jesus spoke about values. Last week, we looked in Luke chapter 6 at, at a few of these values when Jesus spoke about the blessings and woes. Blessed are people. And then he went on to explain the kind of people that we would be surprised that they were blessed. The poor, the hungry, those who are mourning, those who have been persecuted because of what they believe. Yet he then goes on and says, woe to, I'm saddened by those people whose focus in life is on eating, getting rich, laughing and being liked by everyone. Jesus set the values of the kingdom differently 
because his kingdom is not just of this world. It's also of the world to come. Jesus knows that if we just focus on the good things in this world, then we'll miss the greatness of the world to come. So we're blessed if we have struggles because it helps us to start hoping for a different world, the world to come. Now, this week we look at the second part of this sermon that Jesus preached. And we hear about a different set of values. And these values are based around loving, giving and forgiving. Now, those three words sound like the kind of words that everyone would want as their values. They sound like the kind of thing that we would all rush towards. But I just want to warn you, Jesus has a habit of giving us these words, wanting to rush into them. And then he slams us with a truth that really undermines, that really gets below some of those long held beliefs and values that we've had. It twists us and turns us and makes us uncomfortable because he wants us to change to his kingdom values, to raise the bar on what it is to be loving and giving and forgiving. So let's have a look at the text in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 verse 27 says, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do, do not withhold your shirt from them. Then down in verse 32, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners that love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. When I first read this, I kind of thought, well, I don't really have any enemies. I can't think through my list. I can't think through anyone who I'd put on a list and say, they're my arch enemy. They're my nemesis. And so I'd step back and I thought, well, well, who are these group of people who would hate me? Who, who's someone who might dislike me? Who, who might have conflict in their heart? And it made me think through those times in my life where perhaps there's been something that's happened and I felt cheated. Maybe I went to buy something and then I found that you could get it cheaper somewhere else and they charged me too much. Ah, oh, the injustice. Or when someone has said something hurtful towards me. And oftentimes, those who can hurt us the most are the ones that we love the most. So perhaps a family member or a close friend or a spouse or a child. Someone who said something that just ah oh, hurts us to the core. What's our response when something like that happens? Now, most of us will first think, well, if someone's hurt me, then in response, I want to hurt them back, right? It seems as though it's a natural response to have some sort of revenge that we might get back when someone's hurt us. Now, this is where in the Old Testament, in Exodus, there's set out a law of reprisal that speaks about an equal, a just punishment for someone who's hurt you. You've probably heard it said about an eye for an eye. If someone oh, punches you in the eye or someone oh, injures you and your eye is gone, then you will want to come back and say, well, what's our fair and just punishment? Well, to take their eye so that they are equally punished. Thing with us is that oftentimes we don't really think about a fair punishment. And that was why this law was first put in place. Because if you hurt my eye, then I want to hurt your both eyes. If you get hurt on the arm, you want to hurt both of their arms. If you get beaten with a bat, you want to come back to them with a gun. And you see it rising and rising and rising. And, and it kind of falls apart. The families go to war over these type of things. You know, what Jesus was saying was not to stop the rising, was not to have equal. He was saying, no, no, no. If someone hates you, love them. If someone curses you, bless them. If someone hits you, let them. If they steal, then ask them, what else do you need? Jesus sets the bar way higher than an eye for an eye. He sets the bar way higher than getting kind of fair revenge and justice is what we might want. He says, no. Go out of your way to bless those who curse you, who, to love those who hate you. How can Jesus say such a thing? Surely God is a God of justice. Absolutely, God is a God of justice. 
But let's have a look at the kind of kingdom that Jesus was bringing in. What did Jesus do for those who hated him? How did he deal with those who wanted to curse him, destroy him, get rid of him? Jesus went to the cross and he died for you and for me. Jesus displays this kind of love by the way he lived out his life, by his actions he brought in this new kingdom. Now, Jesus had the power and the potential to destroy everyone around him. You know, Jesus was being beaten and spat. He could have just made their arms not work. They, they were cursing him. He could have just made them mute. They couldn't speak. Or, or, you know, he could have like clicked his fingers and they would have gone to dust. Jesus was all powerful. Yet with his power, he used his power to bring in a new kingdom of love of grace and acceptance. And we need that power, don't we? For those of us who've hurt God, what do we get back in return? His love. For those of us who've used God's name in the wrong way, we've cursed him. What do we get back in return? A blessing. And so God is showing us how he exists, how he lives. And he calls us to live like that for others. The cross shows us how we are to live. And that's confronting. And that's conflicting. And that's not how we usually live. And we have to fight against the values of this world and build our own values based on the values of the kingdom. Jesus goes on. He says in Luke 6, 38, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I've done a number of sessions of marriage counselling with many, many different couples now. And each time I bring up the question of giving. How are you going to give when you come together? Now, interestingly, most couples haven't even thought about how they're going to do their finances together once they get married, let alone their giving. But it's a really important question because our giving, how generous we are, how we want to live our life with our finances is an important way to bring up a potential conflict within a couple. It's also the time that we need to kind of be grappling with and thinking, how generous are we as individuals? How will we give? How generous are we? Well, Jesus is saying here that, that, that he... He uses analogy of like a cup. And in those days in the ancient Near East, uh, you would bring your cup and you would agree upon the amount of money you would pay for your cup of grain, let's say, or your measure of grain. And so there would be an agreed upon price. And then you would take your cup and dip it into the sack and get your grain. Now, now they would shake it and make sure they got as much grain in their cup as they possibly could. It reminded me of when I was growing up, if I ever had a Slurpee. Now, now these days, Slurpees are cheap. They're like a dollar, you can get a big Slurpee. But, you know, growing up, they were expensive. You, you went now and again, they were a real treat. And so you would go in and you would get, you know, a big cup. You would start filling it up and from the different. But once you got a, a little way, you would tap the bottom to make sure all of that Slurpee juice kind of got packed in there. And then you would make sure the lid went on. So you got the extra 10% on the top and you would keep tapping and filling filling and filling until bleh, it kind of splurts out over the top. And as you go into the counter, you're sucking up the, that little bit extra that you got. You want to make sure you get the most possible in your Slurpee cup. Even though it's so big, there's probably never going to be able to drink it all in one sitting. Jesus said in the same way, we should be generous. Our generous generosity should be so overflowing that it's like we're packing it into our life, that our life is filled with generosity. That's the type of life that Jesus calls us to live, an incredibly generous life where our generosity is overwhelming the people around us. And so it, it brings us kind of back to this question, do we live generous lives? Is our generosity like a Slurpee? Imagine if you gave 1% of what came in. And maybe for a lot of Australians, that's probably about the amount that they do give, about 1% of their income. Now, if, you, if God said to you, I'm going to give you my blessings dependent on what you give, 
And you say, well, I give 1% and I get 1% of God's blessings. If you knew God was going to give back to you in that way, maybe, maybe we'd give a little bit more than one. Maybe we'd give 2%, 10%, 20%. How generous would we be if we knew that it had a direct correlation to how God would be blessing us? Now, be careful. I'm not speaking here about the prosperity gospel that says you give a hundred dollars to God. He'll give you a thousand dollars back. And and those people who have kind of pyramid schemes around God being their holy ATM machine. That is not what I'm talking about here. When we're talking about generosity, absolutely financial generosity is a part of it. But so is the generosity we give of our time, of the gifts that we've been given, the things that we're good at, those those talents that we have, the jobs, the, the professions, how generous we are in our lives. Jesus gives us a promise here that there's some kind of return on that generosity that comes back to us. As we give, God gives back to us. And I'm reminded every time we have communion, when we look at the the bread and the juice, that Jesus didn't give sparingly, but he gave it all. He gave his whole body, all of his blood was shed for us, for those who are in relationship with him. Jesus sets the bar for generosity by giving it all. And then he puts it out there for us to follow. Love Give and forgive. Jesus says, do to others as you would have them do to you. uh, um, Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. This first one here, do to others as you would have them do to you. That's called the golden rule. It's kind of the rule that we want to teach all of our children. Do to others as you would have them do to you. It's a good way to be able to think and process how to treat other people, right? Well, I wonder, like if I hit someone, would I be happy for them to hit me back? Well, not really. I mean, I guess maybe, but if I'd hit them, I'm sure there was a really good reason why I hit them because I generally don't hit people. Maybe that's not a good example. If I stole from someone, would I be happy? I don't really steal from people. That's probably not a good example. If I talked about someone in a way that wasn't good for their character, that wasn't loving and truly wasn't kind, that's probably one of the things that I've done. Would I be happy for them to speak about me in that same way? No, I I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't like them to speak about me in a bad and disparaging way. No, I, I wouldn't want that to happen at all. You see, oftentimes what we do as we look at this kind of verse and say, well, how do I grapple with doing to others as I would have them do to me? I do things that I don't want done to me. And so in the midst of that, I struggle and I think, well, well, how then should I live? And Jesus calls us to live as he lived, not as we would live. To live to his standard, not to the standard that we have or to the standard of others. All too often we look at these calls to values and we say, but but they're not living that way, but they didn't do it. So why do I have to? And Jesus is saying, don't live to someone else's standards, live to mine. It might mean that we are constantly striving and trying, but it means that we're getting more and more and more like the kind of person that God calls us to. He calls us to forgive. Why? You know, if, if not for his forgiveness, if not for what he has done for us, then why would we forgive? Why would anyone forgive? Why would anyone love or be giving unless there's a reason to love? We forgive because God has forgiven us. The God of this universe who is perfect and pure. Whenever we do something that offends someone else, we also at the same time offend God. When we say things that are hateful towards him or towards his creation or towards another person, then we're really offending him. And and so there is an account in heaven that that, that piles up what, what he calls sin, the things that are done against him. And that account we look at next to a holy, pure, righteous God. And we can see that we've done things that have offended him. And so we need to deal with that. We need to work out that kind of transaction. God, in all of his goodness and grace, 
saw that there is no way that on our own we could deal with the weight of sin, the amount of debt that we owed him. And so in his love, because he wants relationship with us, because he is forgiving and loving and giving, he came into this earth, lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death, a sacrifice to pay for the debt that we racked up, that we built. He dealt with it. And if we have a relationship with him, if we ask him to take away that debt, to forgive us, to become one of his children, to come into his kingdom, to become one of his subjects and say, yep, God, you are the king. When we live in light of that, then we come into this space of understanding, forgive because you've been forgiven. Forgive because it's, it's how you base your life. It's the value that you build your life upon, the forgiveness that's been given to you. The, the gospel is at the heart. This good news, this story of God's incredible love and grace is at the heart of who we are as Christians. It must change us. It must make us to be people who are a part of this kingdom and have values and beliefs that line up with his kingdom. Should we fight injustice? Absolutely. Just because we are to be forgiving and giving and loving, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't speak out against those things in this world that we know are broken. And so we are to fight for those things that we, we know would make earth more like heaven. But in this world, when we are hated, we need to love. When there's only stinginess being shown to us, we need to be giving. And, and when, there's, when there's unforgiveness held against us, we need to be forgiving. Jesus finishes with these two little stories. One story says, if you've got a good tree, then it's going to have good fruit. A bad tree will produce bad fruit. If our lives are good, then good fruit will come. If our lives are lined up with the values of the kingdom then good fruit will come out of our lives. If our hearts are good, then our mouths will speak goodness because they're overflowing from the good heart within us. A good heart that's been cleaned by Jesus and that's filled with his love, then loving words come out. And the final story says that there's a builder, two buildings. Uh, one builder builds his house on no foundations. The other builder builds his house on firm foundations. When the rains and the storms come, the, the house without foundations will fall down. The, the house with strong foundations will stand firm. In this life, those of us who build our lives on the firm foundation of Jesus and his values, of what he says are the most important things in the kingdom, our lives will be able to stand even when the storms of life come our way. Those people who base their lives on this world's values and standards, when the storms of life comes, there will be struggle and hardship and trial because their values are not built for this world. They're not built for the kingdom to come. They will crumble and crash. So which values do you stick to? Where are you on this spectrum? How is your relationship with God? I hope and pray that you will want relationship with God, that you will desire his values, that you'll want to change your life to follow him. Today might be the opportunity you need to take that step of faith and say, God, I realize that I haven't been living to these values that you hold to be true. I want to change. I want to line my life back up with yours. Help me, I pray. Because there's nothing that we can do to earn our way to God. We can just come to him and ask for his forgiveness. And as a loving father, he'll take us to his side. And there's nothing we can do in our striving that will make God love us more. We want to live our lives by God's values because that's what's best. And we're honoring him for what he's done in doing that. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you've given us these kingdom values to base our lives upon. But we also know how incredibly difficult they are to follow. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit might be speaking to our hearts today, that we might sense your guidance and your leading, especially in those areas we recognize through this that we need to change. Help our hearts to be aligned with yours, we pray. And I ask Jesus that for those 
who are watching and listening to this today. For those who do not know you and who are apart from you, I pray they might take that step of faith to call on you, to ask for forgiveness, to seek your spirit in their lives, to be transformed so that their foundations, their values and their beliefs might be lined up with yours. They might come into your kingdom and be your children. We pray this, Jesus, in your holy and mighty and loving name. Amen.